Well, grace and peace be multiplied to each of you this evening in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. When I got out of the car, the brother asked me how was the flight. I answered, it landed. <laughs> Thank you for those of you who prayed for me for a safe arrival. It's a joy to be here. Let me publicly express my gratitude to your pastor for the kind, first of all, kind invitation to come and be a part of this weekend with you. And then those kind words of introduction. Grateful and thankful for Dr. Lawson stepping in as only he can do. <laughs> and it's a joy to have this time to open God's word with you tonight. Would you take your copy of God's word and be turning to the book of Titus? in the New Testament. Let me breathe the word of prayer and then I would ask in, in prayer God's blessings on our time together. And then I want you to hear the reading of God's word and together we will listen for what God will say to us tonight out of what he has already said to us in his holy word. Let's pray. We are reminded tonight, Father, of your orchestration of all the affairs of our lives. And you are alone are worthy of our grateful praise for all that you have demonstrated in kindness to us over the course of this day. And for granting us to end the day together in your house that is set apart for the worship of your name, to worship you in spirit and in truth and to think your thoughts after you as you have revealed yourself to us in your holy word. We thank you for this hour and for the text that is open before us, your living word. We ask that you would open our eyes tonight that we may behold wondrous things from your word. Help each of us to lay aside all malice, deceit, envy, hypocrisy, and slander. So as newborn infants, we may crave the pure spiritual milk of your word and grow thereby, having tasted of your goodness. Would you grant me tonight physical strength and spiritual energy to speak your word with faithfulness, clarity, authority, passion, and freedom? And may Christ alone be exalted as the word is explained, we pray. Amen. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15 read, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for the blessed hope and glorious and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Amen. <clears throat> Paul left Titus in Crete to set things in order. He later wrote Titus a short manual on pastoral ministry. Titus had a big assignment. The church needed edification and organization. The Cretans were notoriously wicked. 
and false teachers opposed the truth of the gospel. Paul gives Timothy a simple charge for the work ahead. Verse 1 of chapter 2 says, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Titus, know that charisma, campaigns, creativity will not accomplish the needed gospel work. Titus must teach. But it is not the act of teaching that would produce life and health and growth. Titus must teach those things that accord with sound doctrine. Teach sound doctrine. There are many professing Christians who dislike that word. They think doctrine divides. They feel we should just be able to follow Jesus without arguing about theology. But here we are reminded that sound doctrine is essential to spiritual devotion. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, Jesus says, after saying, make disciples and mark disciples, he then says, mature the disciples by teaching them to observe, literally to obey all that I have commanded you. Disciples of Jesus think and act in trusting obedience to his commands. So Paul charges Titus to teach sound doctrine, what, whatever others may say or do. I love this language, verse 1. But as for you, let the crowds do what the crowds will. But as for you, teach what accords to sound doctrine. Verses 2 through 10 list the categories and content of the sound doctrine Titus was to teach. These were not, however, matters of individual piety. Titus was to teach the saints how to live together as the church. They could not be devoted to Christ unless, in a real sense, they were devoted to one another. And so, in these instructions, verse 2 addresses the older men. Verses 3 through 5 address the older women. Verses 6 through 8 address the younger men. Verses 9 and 10 address the bond servants. These are more than just household codes that would teach the saints how to conform to the cultural norms around them. These instructions are countercultural. To use a stronger word, they were. These instructions are supracultural. They reflect a way of life that is only made possible by the gospel. For instance, verse 10 explains why bond servants should be trustworthy so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Back in the day, Howard Hendricks used to say that there were too many Christians who are like bad photographs, underdeveloped and overexposed. My children wouldn't get that. But here we are reminded that our lives should display the beauty of the gospel. Mark it down, friends. How you live matters. How you live matters. Why does it matter? It does not matter because that in our Christian living, we are trying to 
win God's approval or earn God's favor or merit God's love. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 makes that clear. He saved us, not by works done by us in righteousness, but by his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. We are not saved by anything we do for God. We are saved by trusting what God has done for us through the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here we are reminded that Christian theology and Christian ethics are married and must never be divorced. It is not that we get into the family of God by grace and then stay in by works. It is all of grace from beginning to end. And really, that's the heart of the text before, before us. That's the message of the text. That's the point of the text. Verses 1 through 10, if you will, build the structure of the Christian life. But verses 11 through 15 lay the foundation for the Christian life. Connected with the term for at the beginning of verse 11. We're to live out the life of the teachings of our faith on the foundation of God's grace toward us. Grace is the foundation of the Christian life. In these verses, he'll show us how grace covers our past, our present, and our future. What is the grace of God that saves? Paul summarizes the grace that saves in this text. Would you consider the text with me in terms of two appearances, quote unquote, the appearance of grace and the appearance of glory. First note the appearance of grace, the appearance of grace. Grace is the unique feature of the Christian message. One writer calls it the last best word. Grace is truly amazing. And it is what sets apart the message of the gospel from the teachings of world religions. One way or another, the religions of the world are trying to teach men how to reach up to God. The gospel of Jesus Christ begins by confronting us with the fact that we are never able as guilty sinners to reach God's righteous standards. But God has reached down to us. In the virgin birth, virtuous life, vicarious death, and victorious resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace reached down to us. Grace saves says verse 11. In fact, verse 11 states the, the source and the scope of saving grace. The source, verse 11 says, for the grace of God has appeared. Grace is the unmerited favor of God to unworthy sinners. It could have been another way. It should have been another way. It would have been another way. However, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. God is gracious. It is a part of his perfect nature and character. 
Our holy God is a gracious God. No, verse 11 says, this grace of God has appeared like a special epiphany. And and the the grammar indicates a decisive act. And what he is describing here is not a theological principle. It's a living person. Grace has a name. Jesus. Jesus is the living, breathing grace of God. When the text says the grace of God has appeared, it is referring to the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, and the word became what? Flesh. Y'all forgive me, I'm a black Baptist preacher. I might ask you to talk to me every now and then. (laughs) And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. To know God's grace, you must know God's son. Later in that same chapter, John 1, verses 16 and 17 says, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. But notice the scope of this saving grace. He says the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. Here, we see the nature of grace. Grace is about more than God's kindness to bestow life, health, and strength food, clothing, and shelter, family, friends, and loved ones. Grace is about salvation. The word means rescue and deliverance. And in the Old Testament, it was used for divine intervention in all kinds of difficult circumstances. But ultimately, grace is about not merely our problems, but our biggest problem, our greatest problem, our ultimate problem. We all share the same greatest problem. God is holy and we are not. And we will give an account to God for how we have lived our lives and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God has saved us from eternal punishment that we rightly deserve by the sacrifice, substitution, and satisfaction of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For our sake, he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we may become in him the righteousness of God. This grace of God that has appeared in Christ is available for all people. No, this is not an affirmation of the heresy of universalism, which would claim that everyone will get to heaven one way or the other. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 46, at the end of the parable of the sheep and the goats, Jesus says, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. In that sentence, Jesus uses the word eternal twice for eternal punishment and eternal life. However you define the term, it means the same thing in both places. Eternal punishment is as long as eternal life. The bottom line is that every person will spend eternity somewhere. Your eternal destiny is determined by what you do with Jesus. You must repent of your sins and trust in Christ for salvation. John 3.16 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And so the fact that this salvation appears to all people does not mean that all will be saved without exception. It, it means that all can be saved without distinction. No matter race or gender or status or age, as you read the previous verses. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. In fact, this sovereign grace is the driving force of world missions. Jesus declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And in Matthew 28, he declares, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. Grace saves. But then Paul tells us the grace sanctifies. Verse 12 further explains the grace that saves as that grace which is training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. The grace that saves is the grace that sanctifies. Saving grace is not cheap grace. Bonhoeffer said, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. Paul is explaining to us that the saving grace of God is more than just a ticket to heaven. The grace that saves also trains. The idea of training here is a picture of training up or bringing up a child. Of course, that involves instruction, but... If you've had children, you know it involves more than that. It also involves rebuke and chastisement and discipline. Grace trains us. We rightly sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. We should also sing. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieved. Grace trains us to say no to sin and yes to God. Grace trains us to say no to sin. That is, verse 13, it trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. This is sanctification in negative terms. We are to renounce, forsake, abandon sin. We are to make a clean break with sin once and for all. Yet, we must daily resist temptation and pursue obedience. Grace trains us. To do this, it trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Ungodliness is to live as if there is no God. Ungodliness often results in immoral behavior. But you can be a moral person and still be ungodly. The Pharisees were considered the most righteous men in Palestine. And yet Jesus constantly rebuked them for the ungodliness in their hearts. Their sinful attitude toward God. 
He says grace trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. The language here causes us to immediately think of sexual sin, yet like the term ungodliness, it's not just action, it's attitude. It is to be driven by the desires of the false value system of the world around us. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or any of the things in it. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, it is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But the one who does the will of the Father will abide forever. In 1 John 2, 17, we have a clear statement of the economy of Scripture. If you want to know the value system of Scripture, it is simply this. What lasts the longest is worth the most. And so the text rightly says that we should not spend our lives pursuing the passions of this world that are fading away. Grace trains us to say no to those sinful things. But while grace trains us to say no to sin, grace trains us to say yes to God. Verse 13 says it, it's training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present world. Negatively, we are to say no to sin, but positively, we are to say yes to God. Grace trains us to say yes to God. This is more than just religious reform. This is spiritual transformation that only the sovereign grace of God can produce. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. Grace can train you to say yes to God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ can clear your past, conquer your problems, and change your personality. It will enable you to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. The terms are synonymous, but... Consider the three dimensional implications of the term. Self control relates to self, upright relates to others, godly relates to God. Grace enables us, trains us to live self controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. That term sets us up for what he will say in the next verse. But also consider that the present age. It's not just a contrast to the coming age, the coming of Christ. It is also a statement about the wicked culture that they lived in. He is reminding them that the sinful environment of the world around you must not be an excuse for you to compromise your obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember in Philippians 4.22, Paul gives greetings from the saints in Caesar's house. Wherever providence plants you, grace can train you to say no to sin and yes to God. And so this foundation of grace upon which we live for Christ is presented to us first as an appearance of grace. But then there is the appearance of glory. Verse 
There's a story that I think about often. I read years ago of a pastor who was kicked out of his church. And some concerned members walked him to his car and asked him, what are you going to do now? And he told them, I'm going to heaven. I mean, of course you are, pastor, but you don't have a job anymore. (laughs) What are you going to do now? They, They kept finding different ways to ask him the same question, and he kept giving them the same answer. I'm going to heaven. What they didn't understand was that the fact of his eternal hope was what gave him strength to face the present crisis. It is this blessed hope with which we live. Paul says to us here that saving grace waits. That's verse 14. He describes us as waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Christians are people of hope. And biblical hope is not wishful thinking. It is great expectation, spiritual confidence, Future-focused faith rooted in the unfailing promises of God. Hope, as it is used here, is objective, not subjective. It is an objective hope for which we wait. And using peculiar language, he says it is not just a hope, it's a blessed hope. The two terms are not usually put together like this. And yet, thinking about the truth of the believer's hope, we find here Paul making a remarkable statement of blessed assurance rooted in two facts. We live with blessed hope rooted in two facts. Fact one, Jesus is coming. We are waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Waiting here is not patient endurance. It is eager expectation. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things unto himself. We are waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of Christ. He appeared once in grace. He will appear again in glory. When he appeared the first time, he was despised and rejected by men. John 1, 11 is just always a sad verse for me to read. He came to his own. And his own people did not receive him. He was despised and rejected, but oh, friends, when he comes again. He will appear in glory. And every eye will behold him, even those who nailed him to the cross. Philippians 2, 9 through 11, therefore God has highly exalted him. And has given him the name which is above 
every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadems and crown him Lord of all. Jesus is coming. We have a blessed hope because Jesus is coming. There's another fact. Same verse. Jesus is coming and Jesus is God. We are waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. What a clear and compelling statement of the deity of Christ. Grammatically, contextually, theologically, this, this long phrase is all about Jesus. Some would argue that it, it speaks of of two persons of the Godhead here, God the Father, God the Son. That's not the case, but just play along. If it is, it's still saying Jesus is equal to God. Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God the Father, God the Son, co-eternal, co-essential, co-equal. Colossians 1.15 says, he is the image of the invisible God. I love the language of Colossians 2.9. In him dwells all the fullness of deity bodily. But this is not just others' claim about him. This is not just the apostles' attempt to get a fledgling movement off the ground by claiming deity for their leader. This is Jesus' own claim. Remember John 8, when he is arguing with the unbelieving Jews and he, they began to discuss Abraham and, and they get offended. Abraham has been dead for centuries and you are barely 30 years old and yet you talk like you know him. Do you remember what Jesus said? John 8, 58. Truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Saving Grace waits. But also saving grace works. Verse 12 states the power of saving grace. Verse 14 states the purpose of saving grace. It's a twofold purpose. He says Christ died to redeem us. He gave himself up. For us to redeem us from all lawlessness. Hallelujah. This is a succinct statement of the redemptive work of Christ. Die, Christ died on the cross willingly. He gave himself. John 10, 17, 18. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up again. Likewise, Christ died 
vicariously. He, he gave himself for us. On our behalf, in our place, as our substitute. He was pierced for our transgressions. Crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, every one of us. But we have turned every one to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He died willingly. He died vicariously. But he died purposely to redeem us from all lawlessness. The blood of Jesus redeems us from the guilt of sin and the power of sin. We were lawless. In spiritual rebellion. 1 John 3, 4 says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. But Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us, not merely to set us free, to give us a ticket to heaven, but to, to redeem us from lawlessness. But not only does he redeem us, he purifies us. He gave himself up to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Again, he did not die merely to give us a ticket to heaven. He died to purify us from the defilement of sin that we might represent him in this world as a people for his own possession. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him that brought you out of the darkness, called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light. I like that 10th verse. You were... Once not a people. All of our arguing about racial stuff and polit political stuff, that's God's judgment on it all. Not a people. You were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You did not know mercy, but now you are the beneficiaries of the mercy of God. The goal of this purification is that we would be a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Of course, we are not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. Ephesians 2.10. We, we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are called to a life of good works. Grace calls us to a life of good works. And it is not merely our Christian duty. It should be our consuming passion. We should have a, a burning desire for good works. What does that look like? It looks like 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable. Here's the phrase, always abounding, always abounding. Not every now and then and not the least you can do. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. You are people of a blessed hope. The chapter begins with an instruction to Titus. It ends the same way. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let, let no one disregard you. I don't have time to 
lean into that. That's not a pulpit excuse for poor exposition. That's a whole message by itself. It's a word to the pastors of the church, and it is also a word to the members of the church. The church is to submit to the authority of Christ exercised by the ministry of the word. He's referring back to all of the, he has said in this chapter, in this closing verse. But yes, what you have in this chapter is a call to holiness, but it is also a call to hope. We live out the life of the teachings of our faith, waiting for the blessed hope. The glory of the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Romans 5. Starts with listing all of the benefits of justification. And then turns in verse 3 and says, but not just that. We don't just rejoice in the hope of glory and all of the wonderful. We We rejoice even in our sufferings. Because suffering produces character. Knowing that our suffering produces endurance, that is. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And your hope in God will never be disappointed. Because the love of God is poured into our hearts. What a picture. By the Holy Spirit that he has given to us. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you and praise you afresh for the grace that has saved us. Wretched, sinful, lawless people such as us who only deserve righteous wrath, divine condemnation, eternal punishment. By your sovereign grace, you have not given us what we deserve. You've laid on your son what we deserved. And by a great exchange, you have made us righteous in him. And called us to a new life, called us to be new people. And by that same grace with which you have saved us, you train us and equip us. And strengthen us to live out our lives in devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray afresh tonight that you would help us by your grace to say no to the solicitations of sin. And to say yes to all that you command. Your commandments are not burdensome. But help us do so looking beyond the things of this world that will pass away. Waiting with expectation for that blessed hope. And the glory of the appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. May the life to come which is our blessed hope in the return of Christ. Cause us to be pure even as he is pure. To live out our hope to the praise of your glory. Amen.